Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session. Words fall short of describing the true caliber of a polymath like Satish Gupta. He's a painter, a sculptor, a published author, a muralist, and a calligrapher celebrated equally in India and overseas. At an early age, he won the Sanskriti Award. His works have been um, a deep engagement with mysticism and the Zen spirit. This multifaceted genius has been exhibited in over 37 solo shows at important art galleries within India and abroad. Satish's paintings and sculptures enjoy a place of pride in some of the top luxury hotels in Delhi and Bangalore. His works are in museums internationally, including the Shanghai Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Sacred Arts, Brussels, and the National Museum in Slovenia. His signature sculptor, Surya, the sun god, can be seen at the Indra Gandhi National International Airport in Delhi. He was also commissioned for an exquisite 30-foot uh, mural for the Bengaluru Air International Airport. Satish's seven-meter monumental sculpture, The Buddha Within, is in the permanent collection of the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. Um, his book, Zen Whispers, was released at the Jaipur Literature Festival in 2018. He's also a gifted poet and has participated in various uh, prestigious uh, poetry conferences internationally. His writings have also been published in international publication in English, Spanish, and Catalan. We are greatly honored to have him with us today to share with us a glimpse of his works and take us on a tour through his studio. So welcome Satishti and thank you for joining us. Welcome, welcome to my studio in Gurgaon for Razen. Uh, hello friends, I'm here for taking you on a virtual tour, answering your questions, introducing myself, we get better. I think uh, we'll start with showing a small video on your works and, and then we'll start with some question answers. Uh, so Soma, would you help us um, run the video please? I'm the shadow, I'm the light, I'm the dewdrop, I'm the ocean, I'm the dragon, I'm the dragonfly, I'm the mist, I'm the mountain, I'm wisdom, I'm ignorance, I'm death, I'm life, above all, I am. I want people to feel almost protected with my work and yet free. So that's what I've done in my sculpture, The Buddha's Within. It is like being in a womb. In the big head and the rear is like a cave. I have made 1500 Buddhas, 500 for the past, 500 for the present, 500 for the future. Because I want to show the whole life cycle, the timelessness of it all. Garuda is both in Hindu and the Buddhist myths. And he's a demigod who preferred to remain a demigod. He surrendered his ego to help others. Buddha to me is a metaphor for something divine. I've inscribed the Buddhist mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, on the pebbles, on the rocks, on the trees, on the sky, and the flowing prayer flags. I 
I'm really fascinated by the elements because that's all that we are. And if we don't really respect the elements, they can take over. They can be very friendly and they can be very punishing. The mandala and the shunya are about movement. They're about life. Everything is turning. Everything is moving. But then it comes to stillness and silence. Emptiness and fullness. The whole cosmos is shunya. With the nebulous and the steadfast merge, the dark and the light come together. That's what the works are all about. That was a lovely video and I think a very apt introduction to your Zen philosophy. So, you're a very unique artist, Satish Ji. A poet, a sculptor, a painter, a writer and a calligrapher. Which of these come to you first? Or do these all of these aspects come into play when you are working on a piece? You know, for me, there is no duality. Whether I'm painting or I'm sculpting or I'm writing a poem, or I think it's ultimately it's about creation. So I think it really depends on what the what I want to express. And sometimes it comes out as a, as a haiku, sometimes it comes in a, um, a painting form, or sometimes in a calligraphy. But I think um, since the sculptures take a long time, sometimes it even takes about over two years to do one sculpture, like the Buddha's within, I took me more than two years. Uh, with about 20 people working with me, uh, my, uh, my helpers, and my class people. So it took two years. So at that time, obviously, I cannot work day and night. Uh, so there are times in between where I have to think back, to relax and reflect. That time I think or I make smaller things. So it really depends on the kind of thought that is going in my mind. And I follow that. So how did you get into uh, the Zen philosophy of things? Because most of your art is reflective of the philosophy you follow. Uh, yes, uh, when I was on a scholarship, when I was in my 20s, I was in, uh, on a scholarship and I was, uh, you will see, I, I, my great passion is books and I, was, I would really miss books because there was hardly any money on my scholarship. Um, to make two ends meet and buying books was impossible. So I would, uh, I was just walking down one day down the quay opposite Notre Dame in Paris and I saw a secondhand bookshop which was called the Shakespeare Bookshop and I walked in and there was this book which was uh, which changed my life. Uh, that, from that moment my life was just transformed. It was a book called Zen flesh, then bones, like all heads. And I picked it up for a um, few francs and I uh, read it and I absorbed it. And it answered um, many, many questions which I had in my own mind. But more than that, I think it posed so many more questions uh, which I have gone through a long, long time, many, many years. To uh, working in different mediums, different things, questioning life, questioning everything that I saw or I see. And now I've come to a point where I find that the questions themselves are the answers. You know, so you have to realize that you need to be able to really feel um, relaxed with, with there is no duality, that we just all come together. Yeah. And you've written a book about it as well, so Zen Whispers, which was launched, released in the Jaipur Literature Festival in 2018. Uh, would you like to read us some part of it, a section of it from your book? From the book in my hand. Uh, um, okay. 
this is the book uh, when this spills since then it has been i have uh, been reading another book this year but that we will see later this is, this is called when this spills it will, and it's got my high code and it's got my short stories and um, my expression on what i feel about non duality about living in the moment is all about that so i read a, sh a short passage is called the milky way there is a small high cool burning desires burning fires sending embers my family used to sleep in an open courtyard on a simple bamboo and hen chapels while gazing at the stars above in my ancestral home in the heart of delhi the fragrance of jasmine would be evocative and sometimes the white cactus flower would open its magic petals to blossom to the night only to fall back into its cell with the first ray of sunshine the air was unpolluted and you could still be one with the elements so often in the middle of the night it would start raining and my siblings and i would quickly move are passed to the shelter of the veranda cursing the rain gods in our broken sleep my mother strong determined loving and protective would use the holes to wet the floor and our bed sheets to keep us cool in the summer heat which was extremely hot not as hot as now but was still hot while the pedestrian fan would Lullaby of the sleep to the swirling wind. She would tell us mythological stories about various gods and goddesses, and their celestial battles. Though she was knowledgeable about astronomy, her simple tales made me wonder about the cosmos in our insignificant, insignificant place in it. Now this is an illustration of the uh, in the book with the stories. When she passed away, hundreds of well wishers gathered at her home. Four male, male members of the family carried a body on a cot over their heads in the Indian tradition. It was the month of June and the temperature was soaring. one of the four pall bearers i was under the shade of the cot she was still protecting me from the blistering sun i felt as i stood by her funeral pyre a strong flame borne by a gust of wind surged my face was it her last kiss the next night we went to the cremation grounds to collect the ashes after they had cooled we washed the bones in milk to seed the ash from the bones to save even the tiniest bits of tremors in the ganges the next day i was bare chested while performing the ritual with my brothers on the dark night the tiny particle of speckling ash the remnants of the um, of the charred bones wet from the milk clung to my body and glistened in the moonlight like billions of stars in the milky way the spiral sees the sea above me this is one of the stories from the book and there are many short stories and many haikus in which uh, i've expressed myself over the last this written over the last 30 years this book it was beautiful thank you for sharing that wonderful so um i'm sure you are inspired by a whole lot of artists yourself so tell us about one piece of art by any contemporary artist that inspired you or blew you away and who are your favorite artists oh uh, i have so many favorite artists who have inspired me uh, from the early 14th century chinese painters to some of the uh, later spanish painters some 
uh, many, many painters, but amongst the Indian painters, I was truly blown out of my mind when I saw, I think it was in 2004 or 2005, I saw a fantastic work by Guy Tonde, one of our most famous artists in India. This work was hanging in the old Taj Hotel in Bombay, and I was just speechless in front of it. And um, it also inspired me to contemplate more because I was moving in that direction. I knew I was over the years, over the things, but somehow it was a, it was a moment where something crystallized in my mind and gave me a further direction to continue with my work in um, in the Zen spirit. So that is a great great inspiration from that work. Interesting. So, which Indian art form is your favorite and why? Uh, I am partial to the, to the sculptures, you know, to the, uh, when I visited the great Kenashna temple in Elora, it was an experience that cannot be replicated. So that has been uh, a great inspiration. My first encounters with in Mahabalipuram with the rock temples and yes. the Chola bronzes above all have really inspired me and a lot of my work is, um, is I would say, uh, I, feel, I feel that, you know, I'm continuing that tradition of the Chola bronzes, but in a contemporary way. Sometimes I even feel that I'm one of those artisans from that time, which has been brought into the uh, modern world, and I'm continuing that tradition. I feel very strongly competitive. <laughs> In terms of technique, um, how much it must have evolved, no? From when Chola bronzes were made to what you must be doing now. So, tell us a little bit about the technique. Uh, well, my technique is uh, on the sculpture. Uh, it really started um, when I got a major commission by the general group. Uh, and they wanted me to do five sculptures, which were uh, um, which were enormous. There was like about you know, 23, 24 feet. And this is a group of five uh, sculptures on the five elements that I proposed. And uh, I wasn't a sculptor then, I, I was only a painter, but this was a big, big challenge. So I, uh, and, but I, luckily I had about two years time to, um, to work my process and things. So I worked for almost a year and a half. I traveled the world. I saw some of the, um, the monumental sculptures all over the world. And I came back and I, I was still working in the traditional way. And I made one of the elements, which was, a, I made it in plaster, on mud and plaster. It was the torso of, the, of a figure, of a flying figure, which was about 20 feet um, across. And I worked for almost six, eight months on that in, in the traditional way. And then it was right here, it was in one of these rooms, it was locked up, the studio was still being built. And I had in my gallery space, I had made a market of uh, the volume because these were huge sculptures. They were 23 feet and some were reclining, some were sitting. And I had um, made a sort of a buildup of plywood structures to just get the volume. And I told my, once I'd finished with that, I told my uh, assistant here to remove, throw those out. And that time there was no cell phone, it was about 20 years back. And when I came here to the studio, I saw people with that uh, sculpture, somebody had a head, because the studio was under construction. Somebody had the head, somebody had the arm, somebody had the torso, and they were dancing on the stage and they had shattered the whole sculpture. So it was, um, I was devastated. You know, so much of my work was just gone into smithereens within a few minutes, but it was an opening. And that's what I have learned over the years. When there is chips are down, something new comes up. So I told my friends, the collectors, that I will start fish. I didn't tell them about the accident. And I said, I would like to do it on the spot. So within six months, I made these five massive sculptures. And how it started, I didn't have a technique, I didn't have anything to go. And 
I was contemplating, I was meditating in that space. It was a 40 cubic feet of space uh, with glass walls all around. And you would see from the left, you would see it from the top, you would see it from the bottom. So it was a big challenge. And I was thinking what I'll do. There on the far end of the wall, there was a, a terracotta pot, which, was, which had the face of the, uh, like the, um, the wall of the evil eye. There was a face of a devil looking kind of a thing. So I, was, uh, I had a paper started drizzling, and I tore up that paper. And in a moment of inspiration, I took this little square piece of, um, of one inch by one inch paper, and I walked across this, uh, that many, like several meters, and I stuck this little piece of newspaper on that pot. And we have to see in the Buddha's uh, Buddha that is here, Ananda, you see these little squares. That's how the technique was born. It was completely out of the out of the book, completely out of the box, and something that could have been very, very tragic gave me an opening into a new world. Very interesting. So we we'll talk a little bit about um, a little bit about your artwork, um, and I think we've uh, prepared some slides as we ask you questions uh, for for our viewers to understand and see what we are talking about. So the Buddha within uh, is like a cave with a life-size Buddha lying down. And the cave walls have 1,500 micro Buddhas sculpted on them. That is what we saw in the video as well. Um, is the art your way of praying or meditating? Uh, yes, this is... Um, um, yeah, this was, I was in the Dambula Caves at the time of the, of the tsunami. And I was lucky to be inside the caves at that time. Um, this was just a matter of chance that I happened to be there. And I right. was looking at all these Buddhas. And uh, I got several phone calls that the tsunami has happened. And I was told to rush out of there. And people said, you know, you should get out. And there was a panic and there was, um, you know, uh, so many people died. I was to be in a hotel that day, which was washed away in Gaul. Uh, oh. So many people died, but I was just fortunate to escape that. But it left a very deep uh, kind of an impression on me. And I felt that, you know, somebody else has gone in my place. Uh, and it took me really eight years to come to terms with that. And I uh, sculpted this Buddha. It speaks of the tremendous calm that Buddha had on his face through it all, through all the turmoil. And I kept thinking through the centuries, the calmness and the being together uh, and being still is what is really important uh, to feel uh, that presence. And it's about the omnipresence of Buddha. Um, or any, I mean, when I say Buddha, to me, it's, uh, it's a divine presence, which I feel is everywhere. It's omnipresence, you know, through time and through space and everything. Uh, that stream of consciousness is running endlessly. And that is what yeah. this work is about. Beautiful. And uh, you've also made this... Uh famous sculptor, sculpture at the Indira Gandhi International Airport, um, the Surya. And what was the ideology behind this particular sculpture? Uh, Surya, as you know, is the sun god. And it is, uh, uh, it is international. It's not a religious icon, which was the belief that we couldn't have a religious icon. So I made Surya, which is, uh, the sun is uh, pretty universal. It's in all, our, all the world cultures. Uh, and uh, so this was, um, this was created with that thing in mind that it had to be for an international audience, which would understand that. And when you, it, it's really surprising because I wasn't conscious of it. Um, it has the circle at the back. And it has uh, uh, the form at the back is like the turbines of a jet. And it's a space vehicle. It became like that. And I realized it only when I 
finished it. But all the and all the yeah, it was very very amusing because sometimes when I was looking at the jet engine close up and I saw that <laughs> it looks the same. So it's yeah. uh, I think it's a divine grace that brought it. But all the numbers are uh, all the forms of the are on on time on on the weeks on the days on the years the eclipses the I um, mean yesterday was the equinox. So it's all uh, it's all mathematically calculated, which I have uh, you know, worked on on that sculpture. Interesting. So most of your sculptures are uh, kind of male deities, or I don't know if they have a gender or not, but they look like male deities. However, you made a Devi, which is placed at the Leela Palace. Uh, tell us a little bit about. Uh, this particular sculpture, which is at the Leela Palace. Well, um, you know, I'm, my first sculpture was a Shiva, which uh, uh, that was the very first sculpture, which is now up in the Himalayas in a, in a private collection. Uh, it's, um, and the second sculpture was the Surya. And so I had a Surya, as you know, is also Brahma. Uh, Surya is Brahma. The, um, the creator and the Shiva, the person who uh, releases, who is not, I mean, it's falsely said that he's a destructor, but he's, uh, he releases you from the bondage of life. So, but to energize this, um, the, the feminine energy was needed. Otherwise, Shiva, as you know, if you remove the E, if you shove, it is death. So to energize that, I needed a, a feminine energy, and that's why I created the Devi. And the Devi at the Leela is all the Devis combined together. So there's there's um, uh, there's Kali, there's Durga, and there is Saraswati, which you, which is represented in the sculpture by the symbol of the lion at the base, and then the flames of Kali and the lotus that you see on the crown. Of the for Beautiful. This is this is one of my favorites. Thank <laughs> um, you. I want to now talk about <laughs> I want to now talk about the mural at the Bangalore International Airport. Um, it is ten meters long and it is very reminiscent of the uh, you know the Monet style of water lilies. Did Monet's work inspire you anyway when you were conceptualization uh, conceptualizing this particular installation? It's very interesting that you notice that. Of course, it is inspired by Monet. When I was a student in uh, in my twenties in Paris, uh, I used to worship that work. I used to take the metro and walk across, and I used to go to the Orangerie where. There are two circular rooms with the Monet's lilies painted all around. And I would sit there on the bench the whole day, absorbing that work. And I, through the years, this, uh, this thing has come in my mind again and again. The lotus, the purity of the lotus, the, the silence of the lotus, um, the divine quality of the lotus, it keeps appearing in my work. So yes, it, it was a great inspiration. and this. Um, this work I've called the Lotus Sutra. It's a 30, 30 feet across work. It's a, it's a major work. Uh, and it's got thousands of images of Buddha embossed on, on the Lotus images, which are, uh, which are going through the whole life cycle from, from the little bud to the full flowering to uh, the leaves falling to death and then rejuvenation. That's a lot of my work is about this whole cycle of life. Yeah, it's beautiful. I want to now talk about the one mile long calligraphic canvas that you did along the beach in Pondicherry. Um, how did you manage it and what was the purpose of this huge piece of art? Uh, well, uh... I really, I love scale, you know, I really love scale and I could, 
if I had my way, I would paint the skies, you know. So <laughs> this was, <laughs> this was, yeah, I would take a big broom, clean the air, clean the thing, and I would make a, make a calligraphy in the air. That would be the ultimate work. I've uh, seen but, some of your brushes that you keep inside, so I'm sure with that massive broom, broom-like brush that you have, you could do that. <laughs> yes, I would love to do that. Maybe one day. When I'm going towards another space, maybe I'll clean it on the way. Uh, so uh, this work, uh, I was very, very um, conscious of the global warming and also the need for people to know what is happening in the world and what is happening to the human being and what, what chaos we are creating for nature, uh, and which has been so clearly brought forth by the pandemic. Now everybody is conscious of what we have done to nature, what we have done. So this was the whole idea was to make people aware of the environment. And I got, um, I uh, sort of drew the symbols of the five elements. And there was an invocation to the five elements to give us peace and to give us knowledge and to give us uh, see non-duality, see all those things. So there was a whole um, homage to the elements. And I, um, I got these things woven on the canvas uh, over five, 500 meters. And we spread, we blocked the whole promenade, which is exactly 1.6 kilometers, one mile long, from one end of the, of the road to the other end. And we rolled the canvas onto the, onto the tarmac. And we had uh, uh, different groups of dancers and uh, musicians. And they were, um, uh, Mahesh Vinayakram was the sutrada. He was singing beautifully while uh, he was on a little rickshaw with his speakers and all. And the dancers were dancing, and I was painting along uh, the the elements. I was doing fire, water. So as I was going along, the dancers were dancing, and I was painting this the huge, huge brushes. But somehow, uh, what happened was the um, I was going to paint it from dusk to dawn. I was going to take about almost twelve hours to do it. But the dancers started dancing faster, and uh, Mahesh started singing faster. So I had to. He paced with that and there was no, no coordination and that we didn't have any time to practice or anything. It was bang on, it was like straight there. Mm -hmm. So I started painting and I'm glad it happened that way uh, because it was, there was no thought. There was, I mean, I didn't have any, uh, it was whatever was in my, inside my mind, inside me, that's the beauty of calligraphy. That has to come from the heart, it has to come here, you cannot have a single doubt on the stroke that you're going to do. It has to just flow like an arrow that's shot. And yeah. you, if you hesitate, you've lost it. So I painted almost, I was totally exhausted by the end of it. I reached um, uh, the end in almost four, four and a half hours instead of 12 hours. But it was a fantastic experience and there were thousands of people watching, thousands of people participating, singing along, dancing along. It was mind-blowing. Fascinating. Um, yeah, you see the aerial shot with the, with the yeah. um, one mile long canvas. It was, uh, it was really an experience. So unique. And where is this preserved now? Out of curiosity. Uh, rolled up and we hope to, uh, my dream is to roll it down on the quay in Paris and take it to the to from Notre Dame and take it all the way up somewhere or or uh, angle up a whole space around in a museum. So we are working on several possibilities and let's see what happens. Maybe in two yeah. different spaces yeah. uh, as we go along when the situation is better we'll have to take yeah. it from and how did you create this such a long stretch of canvas? So did you have to add up and um, stitch up or what? how did you do that? It was done in uh, sections of 200 meters each by, uh, by um, special, uh, it was uh, specially woven for this project. 
in a in a factory. It was specially specially woven, and it right. came in trucks in big big rows, which we pulled out and we joined at uh, at the at two two hundred meters. We joined. Right. How interesting. So um, we would now love you to uh, show us your studio, and uh, let's do a virtual tour of some of your art installations and your paintings and see. Um, your studio. Uh, we can okay. see there is you. You are there behind you. There is a sculpture as well, so yes. we can see that. Yeah. So this uh, this sculpture that you see is called Ananda. It really started in when I was a student. I used to go to the uh, Musée Guimet, and there was uh, uh, there was a head of uh, um, of Shiva. And I mean, Shiva and Buddha were interchangeable as uncle. So there was a head which really inspired me. And I saw uh, photographs by um, uh, Mark Ribu, who's uh, uh, he'd just done these fantastic pictures of Angkor. And Madame Ribu, his mother, inaugurated my show. So I was introduced to that book very, very early. And it really inspired me. So this is a the recollection, I always dreamt of having a, having a tree and having a sculpture under it and letting the tree run over the sculpture like in Angkor, uh, where you know, the, the sculpture and that have become together. So this is a living um, installation. It's done uh, it's over like 15 years now. So you see the roots are guided that and the, you see the big root coming over the yeah the, so the that will come down and it, and you love the thing if I bring the bring the roots and things and the back of it are the a thousand Buddhas so there were five different elements just like a mantra which is repeated on that. Right the wall uh, behind is yeah and the wall behind yeah. yeah so I'll take you now yeah. on a on a virtual tour of the of the of this this my space so you see i was telling you this tree i planted when i built this the studio this was about 25 years back this was the first uh, house in this this was all jungle there was no dlf there was no south city there was nothing and i came here and i built this and i built a sort of a little uh, tree house for my for my son who used to climb on a rope onto this. Uh, so this was this has many, many stories. And you see now, um, see this is a very special tanka. It was brought from a monastery in Tibet and from this called signatures of the Lama who fleed uh, who really ran away from from the monastery when you know when our friends were there taking over? So it's got their handprints. It's got the uh, any impressions on that. So it's, it's, this is also two of my sculptures, which are um, Buddha's enlightenment. So you see the leaves falling, the the bow leaves falling, and the Buddhas are in there. So you see. Now this is this is a uh, another sculpture of mine, which is the linga, which is which has got the Shiva symbol. I had done three works, which was um, Kedarnath, Badrinath, and Amarnath. So these are two. One of them is not with me; it's somebody else in London. This is um, parts of the Haveli, which. I was painting the desert for over 13 years and I was painting this wall uh, with, in my desert collection and there were, I have actually clung onto this wall to request the people to let me finish it because they want to break this house and build an ugly sort of a cement structure. So when they dismantled it, I bought the whole Aveli which I have yeah. used uh, in different parts of the house as uh, access. 
So you see here, well, this I've made a little space where one can sit. I've used sections of it. I've used it on, and there you see on top, this is um, a window uh, somewhere. This, this little piece is from Gujarat, which I bought. So I got these objects and then I build the space around it. Normally people go and they find a um, thing, find, uh, build their uh, sort of the concept and then they look for things, which I think is the wrong way to do it. Because I love the objects, I live with them, I, uh, they're my life. So I really have the space which I want for each object. Um, it is really designed, designed like that. This is really the entrance of the house. We were sitting already inside the house, but this is the entrance of the house and this is a Garuda. And Garuda, as you know, has been in a lot of my work. So you see, uh, these are shells from different parts of these are Yalis. And that's another Anka you see. Many, many years after. So now I'm stepping out to the main entrance. This is a sculpture which was in my last show. It is in marble. Uh, it is from the collection The Roaring Sea and the Still Mind. And you see here, you see that's my symbol up there again my champa trees which i've all planted when i got this place so now we're going into the into the gallery space this is part of my sculpture of the it's called shiva's moons this is uh, it's lights up at night you know i light it up at night it's got a lightning coming this is again there were three sculptures for uh, the phases of the moon. This is the door of the house. And again, you see my symbol on the door, which is the symbol, yeah. just my signature. Uh, that's also the Tibetan Om, and it's also reminiscent of the infinity symbol. There you see it again at the entrance of the gallery. So this is the entrance of the gallery. It's called Zen Space, and this is a work. Now I will recall what I was saying. This Angkor and the Hill Roots. This is from my private collection, which I hope I never have to sell. This is, and it's wonderful. Can you hear the? The quail, I have many, yes. many birds here. I have peacocks here who, uh, who make this place really alive. Now we're entering the space of the gallery. And this is my sculpture, the Basque wave. This is uh, this was created. This is talked about life and death, and I was uh, just thinking about the wave. And there's a little haiku that I've written. Does the wave before dissolving on the shore question its destiny? So this culture is. Uh, was conceived in on a flight coming back from London. I had this moment of inspiration and I asked the hostess to give me a, I had a pen, but I didn't have a piece of paper. So I just scribbled, uh, you see, the, see the, the haiku there. I just wrote that and I was wondering about, it. and especially in these times where it's suddenly, and we are so aware of our mortality. Everybody, uh, I think there's nobody spared who's not thinking of the mortality. And this is uh, such a relevant work at this time, but of course it was done earlier. But I have been always um, 
uh, very conscious of the impermanence of life. And that's really the beauty of life. Because if it was permanent, it would be dead. It would be nothing. You know, it's like uh, it's like wanting immortality is wanting to hold your breath forever. You know? so that's, I think it's a beauty in the transience of life. And here, what I've done uh, is I have dissected a liquid. I have sliced it uh, into different parts. And there you see the wave uh, forming and dropping these little droplets. So I feel that we're all our life, we are like waves in an ocean, but and we're really, when the froth is separated from the wave, that is our life. That is the falling of the froth before it joins the sea underneath. That's the short span of our life. It's beautiful. This is uh, part of your Cosmic Wave series, is it? This. Yes, this is the Cosmic Wave. It was in my last, uh, my most recent show. It's called the Cosmic Wave. So it's interesting so now, you talk about chaos in the world and mortality and interesting how humans leave behind footprints by building monuments like the pyramids or the Taj Mahal. And and here you are talking about the impermanence of life. So what inspired you to create this artwork? I mean, other than the fact that you had a brainwave on a flight from London. Yes, but you know, this is, I think, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I said, that we, we, we want immortality and we build Taj Mahal, we build Abu Simbel, we, but ultimately you realize that nothing, nothing, nothing is going to be permanent. It is, uh, it is the impermanence that gives it meaning to life. And if you look at it, each moment is permanent. It's this moment, there is nothing else. So this moment is eternal. So therefore, yeah. if you're conscious of that, there is no fear of death. There is no fear of um, just melting into the ocean. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. So now I'll take you, I'll show you my other sculpture which is called, it's called Wings of Eternity. These are about uh, in copper, they're about 16, 17 feet high. And um, they're done with very copper eyes. You see, they're almost translucent. You see, I'll walk you around this whole space you see how so this was inspired in um, passion girl i was uh, i was in a top of a gorge which was huge gorge and i was i think you were uh, you we met in bandhavgarh before that that was yes beautiful. and i was on top of the gorge and i saw oh, this fantastic river in low below and there was this eagle flying and in the eagle, the light reflected, he was like the golden eagle. So I got a, I got a feather from a, uh, a friend in South Africa of the, of the crown eagle, whose wingspan is about uh, 12 feet. And I took that um, as the inspiration. I studied a lot about, uh, I studied a lot about the, anatomy of the of the of the eagle and we uh, have built this whole culture on that yeah so i built um, another major culture this is called the eternal flight. Satish ji, if you went a little slower, because I think your connection is breaking now as you're moving in inside. So if you just went a little slower, we'll hear it. Okay. So now we're on the top of the gallery. Um, this is a sculpture. Um, 
It's called the eternal flight. The sculpture, can you see it? Mm -hmm. The sculpture is Beautiful. two and a half tons and it is suspended from a, from a 40 foot high ceiling. Wow. Yeah. So you, you see the feather next to it? Yes. Yes. And you see the scale that you can see the scale of it. Wow. So this was the eagle that was flying on that gorge that I saw, which I turned into the Garuda. So this so has now, a special, special meaning. Yes. These are my haikus, which are now published in a book that I was telling you, uh, my latest book, Zen Inkling, uh, which was released at the Jaipur Lit Fest. So these are some of those works. And I'm taking you to my most sacred, is, this is the Sanctum Sanctorum, which is my, my inspiration, my library. Because I was telling you, I love, I love, I love books. Yeah. So, this you're entering the space, which is like uh, inside the monastery. And this is built with all objects uh, from uh, Buddhist inspiration objects. This is a old uh, Lama's robe. Uh, and this was incidentally also something that I got married in. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, contradictory because a lama getting married. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is um, one of the posters from um, my poetry reading in Murcia in Spain, where I was uh, privileged to be part of a international poetry festival. So now you're showing you my library space. Uh, these are these are all objects and um, all the books I love. You know? all. I know there's another beautiful tanka in there somewhere. Yes, this is a this is very interesting. You know, this is a uh, a tanka which is not Buddhist. It's, um, it's a bond piece, which was a religion before the Buddhist uh, Buddhism. This more animistic. And uh, so it's got the beginnings of the images of Buddha uh, and uh, some of the uh, iconography is very, very similar, but it's, it dates Buddhism, predates Buddhism. Uh, Fascinating. Yeah. This is um, this tanka that you see on the wall, the big tanka. It was um, something I found in Nepal. In a, it was dusty. It was full of mud and dust. And I saw it and I saw how beautiful it was and how precious it was. It was hanging as a, as a sort of a country curtain to hide some utensils in a chai shop on uh, Pilgrim Street or something. So I picked that up and I bargained for it for something like I got for 800 rupees can you imagine this treasure uh, and of course the other Buddha uh, the Tanka I showed you was compensated for that because that is very very uh, I paid a lot of money for that so now can you imagine. see here you see you see a Chola bronze this is 11th century Shiva that's my great inspiration my great my most valuable possession and Beautiful. here you see on the wall, uh, this is my friend who used to be uh, in a contemporary dancing school while I was learning contemporary dance in Paris in my scholarship days. And he was, he performed as Shiva in one of the uh, pieces by Maurice Deja. This is very, very special. You know? Now you see 
now you see my big brushes. Yeah. This is, I painted. <laughs> this was a broom that I I was in a on a trip to Prague, and we stopped. The bus stopped at a petrol pump, and I saw this broom. It wasn't. I decorated it a bit, but it was just perfect. So I dropped out of the of the group and I bought this broom, which is uh, which paints helps me paint beautifully. Uh, my bold strokes. Yeah. So now uh, you see. Yeah. This is this is the view that you get. There are all the Buddhas here, and you get from uh, this is designed. Uh, the whole space is designed that you can from every room, every bathroom, you see green. You know. Now, you hold it. Beautiful. I can see the piece of paper there, and um, we look forward to you doing a calligraphy for us, a live demonstration. And any message you want to give our audience, our viewers in these difficult times would be lovely. Is that ink? Um, that's uh, this one is Somi ink that you see. Uh, it gives a warm tone, and this one is uh, this one is dense black, which is gives me a very rich black. So I'm going to um, do something. I don't know what. It will come spontaneously. Yes. Yeah.
This is a poem, it's a haiku. Uh, we met like two birds in mid-flight, I to sunset, you to sunrise. So one, Beautiful. this is our chance encounters that we, uh, we meet with special people, which our meetings are really transient and one is going in one direction, the other, but there is a, a meeting point which is very very precious and that's what all our life is about is we are meeting yeah. on different levels we're coming together we're drifting apart we're again coming together so this is the ocean of life this is the cosmic ocean the sun it could be the sunset or it could be the sunrise and those are the two birds that are going beautiful on. how lovely and that's thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much it's beautiful Standard. Yeah. So, oh, that was wonderful and so Thank simplistic, you. and yet there's such depth in it. Thank you. And so, now we're just, uh, just walking out of the library and we're coming to the living part, uh, which is also not, not really, I mean, I cannot, I'm, I'm mad because I keep creating all over the place, and Amita gets. So it leaves some walls blind. <laughs> uh, she loves my work, but she also wants the silence. So, yeah, so these are, uh, uh, yeah, do we have time to go up to the... Yeah, yeah. We, we, yes, of course uh, we have. And the weather is good, so it's, it's uh, yeah. the sun is out. I'm sure it'll be nice yeah. to see. Yeah, so I'm taking you quickly to this room, which is... Um, I, some of my earlier works from the my transformation series. Uh, yeah, this is about the physical and the spiritual and the meeting of the two and going beyond that into a spiritual space. These are some of the old Chinese uh, masterpieces scrolls which I exchange for one of my works and when I had a show in Melbourne. This is a work, uh, this is the monk uh, getting rid of his, of his uh, whatever is keeping him tied to the world, his robes and all, but he finds that you cannot get rid of any, uh, any bondage because it's all there, you know. So this is uh, another room where I have some of my other works. This is again a, a beautiful scroll and this I also exchange. It's a 300 year scroll, very very precious. This has got a man in the boat which greatly inspired me. I got it about 25-30 years back and uh, I did a whole series inspired by this work called The Silent Flute. This is one of my very early works. And you see the man on the boat playing a flute in this, yes. uh, in this space. Beautiful. So, so now I'm going to walk you up to the, up to the terrace and we will see, um, we will see some more works, some other collection. And this is part of the, 
courtyard that you see plus a little detail because i'm running out of space to keep my drawing so this is a big huge drawing which i have temporarily parked here this is from my desert series as you see my work keeps changing it's very eclectic um, it you know it goes from total abstraction to um, to realism now you see yeah okay So we're going up to the terrace now. You see my, this is the, the tree which is inspired by the tree under which my buddha sculpture is there this is called the conference of the birds it's inspired by the poem by Atar, who had this beautiful poem it's about our egos and getting rid of our ego so i have i keep putting different birds this is the hopi who who's taking people around who's taking all the birds around to his simbro the, the paradise so you see i have peacocks here and i have actual peacocks who dance with the with my sculpted peacocks who inquire and they were really surprised the first day I built these, and they were coming and knocking on them and trying to see what is going on. So this is a top view of where you see my champa trees, and that is a Brahmsal right in the center with the with the water fountain. And that's the big tree which has grown over the 25 years. I planted it when I got this place. That was the first thing I did when I planted this place. So now we'll go down. And Beautiful. So I think I can uh, start asking people if they have questions for you. Um, um, do please put your Q&A uh, questions in the Q&A tab in case you have any questions from Mr. Satish Gupta. Um, we'll have time for maybe a couple of questions. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, this work is called the uh, Leave Me My Own World. This is a monk uh, sitting within his, within his own space. Now, we'll go down to the other room and I'll answer the questions there. Yeah. Such a beautiful space you have. The Rolling Sea in the still mind, these were my last show, and they had it at the end of the Okay. We have Satish Ji settled 
on a sofa now. So we'll ask him questions while, can we fix the camera somewhere um, in there or we can have it steady? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. We're trying to get something to you know, place this uh, iPad. Somewhere. Yeah, that way we'll have, it, uh, we'll have it steady in one place and then we can ask him questions. Just hold this. I'll just hold this. Yeah, just, yeah. just turn. Sorry, just guys. Just bear with us as we try to yeah. fix the camera. Just bear with the movement. So, Satish ji, lots of compliments are there. My colleagues and our audience are really appreciative of whatever you've shown us and shared your philosophy. Um, simply wow, splendid, soothing work and seeing all these wonderful sculptures has been so calm and serene. Um, then somebody is asking, what makes a person an artist? Uh, what makes a person an artist? I think each one of us is an artist. I think there is no nothing special about an artist. It's only when you become aware that you have you have the Buddha within yourself. You become aware of that that you can express yourself. But each one of us has uh, each one of us expresses it. It doesn't have to be in terms of a painting or in terms of a um, a sculpture. I think art is expressed even in cooking you know if you have if you cook beautifully that's another way of expressing yourself it's ultimately about creation anything beautiful. beautifully put yeah anybody can be an artist and everybody is in some form or the other uh, so which is your favorite work and uh, which work is close to your heart this is a question from Parguni. Uh, among my works Yes, amongst your works. I think it's the last one that I do. It's the last work. Like I just did the calligraphy for you. That work is, would be at this moment, that would be my most favorite, my best work. Because otherwise, if I don't like it, I would destroy it. So it wouldn't exist. You know? So, yeah. uh, and when I look at it the next day, that's when the test is. If it's full stuff to it, it survives, otherwise it goes back to the to where it came from. So there's a question from Anjana, who is a, a budding artist herself. She's asking, uh, you mentioned your style of work keeps changing from abstract to realistic. Uh, which style do you relate to more? Which style do I retain? I just don't retain anything in myself. I just let it just flow through me. I don't think there is anything in life that I want to hold on to. I, I feel like a river, it's just flowing, it's just everything is passing through me. There's really nothing that is permanent, that is that you hold, want to hold on to. It should be just a flow. Yeah. So there's another colleague who's saying such an inspirationally, uh, such an inspirational journey and, and how do you keep consistency with um, your field of interest? This is the question. Sorry, can you repeat that? How do you keep the consistency in your field of interest? How do you maintain your interest, this uh, curiosity that you have to continue to create something? How do I keep it alive? The How, yes, yeah. Uh, I think you have to be aware uh, and you have to be conscious every moment. I think uh, my meditation is not when I am just sitting in the lotus uh, pose or uh, chanting or meditating. Uh, I think the whole meditation has to be carried out throughout your day, throughout your night, throughout every moment of your life. It has to be, you have to be in a state of meditation and silence and then you can reflect and you can see what is what is of value, what, uh, what are the things that you need to do practically to survive in this world, what are the obligations that you do, but you do it very consciously. Like my, uh, my mother taught me, uh, 
cheese will love to sweep the floors and I love to sweep, you know, I mean, like, uh, uh, I have absolutely, this, I think it's a delightful thing, cleaning and cleaning uh, all the garbage, uh, all the dust from the environment and also from our mind. I think the pollution outside may be, luckily now with the, uh, with the situation, present situation, the environment is much more pleasant. But I think the pollution that is in our mind that needs to be cleaned. And then you're at peace, then you can do things with it. So uh, there is a question about how long does it take you to complete a project? Uh, as I was saying, uh, yeah. the Buddha's within, which is uh, my big sculpture in the museum, took about eight years of conception from the time I ex had the experience to the time I expressed it. Uh, it was developing in my mind. But I think uh, physically working on that sculpture took about two years, you know, working non-stop. Mm. Of course, I had breaks in between, as I was saying, but it was a continuous two-year project. So, so there is, is a... Sorry. I do a work very quickly. It can, uh, it can come in a day. So it is not time. The amount of time you spend on the work is doesn't add to its value it, for me. It doesn't add to its value. Yeah. Yes. Something that you do very, very quickly can have be much more meaningful than something that you've taken years and years. But of course, each work demands its own pace. Yeah. Beautiful. So last question, um, and it's an interesting question about art. So uh, traditionally in India, I mean, artists and art weren't viewed with uh, huge amounts of respect in certain areas of sec uh, sections of society. So how would you say um, art is valued now? Uh, and, and how is it viewed? I didn't follow that question very well. Can you explain it to me? So um, there is this question comes from a very traditional um, um, mindset. So art was not valued as something you can make a living out of, for instance. So mm -hmm. how are artists viewed in today's age um, and how are they valued? How are they valued? Yeah. Oh. I think it's also relative, you know, what is the value of art as such. I think only time uh, will, uh, will decide that. There is no, you know, there, you cannot put a value to art, to any specific thing. I think yes. it's the whole body of an artist's work that is of a certain value. And then uh, some particular works are related to that which period, what are the better works which have more value, some things that are not so, have a different value. So it's all very, very relative. But I think, um, I mean, as far as collecting and as far as buying uh, works of art for their value, I think, I, I don't go along with that. I think you should get a work which really inspires you and uh, do your research and do what, what you who are the artists you like, what you like, but go for something that really touches you and moves you and then get that because that is uh, a value that is beyond monetary things. You know, that will inspire you, that will make, enrich you, make your life much, much more meaningful. That's what one should go for. I would yeah, and a famous poet is supposed to have said, a thing of beauty is joy forever. So. There is no, you can't put a value to something that gives you joy each day, every day. Uh, and Absolutely. I think art, art falls in that category. Anything beautiful Absolutely. just gives you joy every time. So it, it was really inspiring and also beautiful to uh, get to know you and see your art and hear about your philosophy the Zen philosophy of life. I'm sure a lot of our audiences are going to pick up that book of yours that you've written. Um, Zen Whispers, guys, if you want to know more about uh, Satish Gupta's philosophy, please pick up that book. It's beautiful. And uh, you'll see much more of his art. 
<laughs> thank you so much for being with us. Thank and you. thank you for your time. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>